Welcome back to Soar Financially. We've taken a little bit of a break, but we're back. And uh, I was on vacation, and we hosted the Deutsche Goldmess just last weekend, and a lot has happened. And I think we've invited the perfect guest to discuss what has happened in gold just recently, because you might have noticed, you might have heard, you might have seen it. We've touched all-time high levels. We didn't really break through it. We touched on it, at least on the future side, over-the-counter, a bit of a different story. But... Uh, it has been positive out there, and uh, as we're recording this today on uh, May 10th, we also got uh, interest rate print, or sorry, CPI print as well. So we'll take a look at that and to sort of categorize it as well and where are things headed. And uh, as I said before, I, I think I've invited the perfect guest, and it's Keith Weiner. He's the CEO over at Monetary Metals. He's down in Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, Keith, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining us yet again. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Always a pleasure, Keith. I think we, we need to talk about what's happening in the gold price uh, overall. B before we dive into specifics, because you've also put out uh, a, a free guide on your website talking about like how gold is sort of misunderstood and how not to think about gold. Let's, uh, let's put some context around it first. Where is gold right now? Where should it be? And uh, what's the overall sentiment? So gold in US dollar terms, um, as you just said, not real far from um, all-time highs um, in other currencies, you know, at or near, you know, much near all-time highs. And, you know, the, the funny thing about it is gold is in a very unloved state at the moment. It's not, you know, nobody's talking about a gold mania. No one is, you know, the proverbial shoeshine boy is not giving you tips on how to buy gold. It's, it's, uh, it's either completely neglected in any kind of serious discussion, or uh, if it's mentioned at all, it's derisively. Um, and and yet, you know, here the price is holding up. And I think the elephant in the room is, you know, declining trust in the banking system, right? So gold, gold being, I, I define gold as money, and I don't want to get into a, a definitional battle, but money is the thing you hold when you want to sell everything else, which is your investments and your speculations. If, you, if now is not the time to be betting on commercial real estate, residential real estate, stocks, um, bonds, you know, there's so much uncertainty. Um, you know, what, what is it, what is it you choose to hold while you ride out the storm and gold is that thing. Gold has always been that thing. Um, and so you're seeing people turning to gold, you know, even if quietly and without much fanfare and certainly, um, uh, certainly not, I, I don't think at this moment, most of it is. I'm going to buy gold because it's going to go up. I think it's, I'm going to buy gold because it's not subject to me waking up in the morning and reading about what just happened to my bank deposit, which is an entirely different, um, you know, motivator. A lot of interesting theories around gold. Like it's not that gold is going up, but it's that the currency you look at it is, is going down, right? So to just the flip side of the coins, it's just gold is not really moving, but uh, the U S dollar is getting weaker. Right? I, is that a I theory to, you ascribe to? Yeah, I love to use the analogy of imagine you're on the deck of a ship, which is both slowly sinking and tossing around in big waves of a storm, and you're looking at a, a lighthouse and saying, that's odd, the lighthouse is going up and down, and mostly up. <laughs> and is the lighthouse really going anywhere? No, it's attached to the rocks. It's, yeah. it's you that's going down and, and tossing. And um, you know, we use the dollar to measure everything. The dollar is manifestly unsuited to measure gold. It's the other way around. You should be measuring the dollar in gold terms uh, rather than um, measure, you know, attempting to measure uh, uh, gold in, in dollar terms. But, well, you, you mentioned gold. Gold is being held held up, or not not held up. It's like the, the price level is holding up quite nicely. Actually, we're at twenty twenty five at the time of recording your per ounce. But who is holding it? Because as you said, nobody's really talking about it. Either we're ashamed of it, personally. I don't know. I, I'm running out of theories. Why is nobody talking about uh, the high price of gold right now? But uh, who, who's buying gold then? Like, who, who's doing it? Um, I, I think it's everybody who's uneasily eyeing the banking system. I mean, look at how it wasn't that long ago that Janet Yellen famously, or I guess now infamously said, there'll never be another banking crisis in our lifetimes. And, you know, at the time people said, well, she's old, so maybe that will be true for her lifetime. Um, but, uh, you know, here we are. And then, um, you know, what was the first one um, before Silicon Valley Bank? I'm trying to remember the name of that bank, a California-based bank. Failed. First Republic? 
No, no, this was no, it was another one. Okay, Valley Bank. Um, I don't remember the name of it. And it was like, okay, well, that's a crypto bank, so you know who cares, right? That Silicon Valley Bank failed, and that was not supposed to happen. Oh. And you know, what's the first thing that everybody from the government comes on TV to says, "This is not a crisis." You know, it's fine, and it, it, it's like the Jedi mind trick. This is not <laughs> the, the banking crisis you're looking for. You know, Sorry. Um, Sir Al Baldwin with the, the little thing. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're making up the rules as they go along. He, you know, first they said on, on Wednesday, both, uh, the, the California banking regulator and Moody said, this was the Wednesday that the bank was actually seized by the regulator on Friday. On Wednesday, Moody's reiterated his investment grade rating and the banking regulator said it's fine. On Thursday, 25% of total deposits was attempted to be withdrawn. And then on Friday, I don't know what the percentage was because they pulled the plug and said, that's it. And then they said, okay, um, uh, if you have a deposit less than the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit, your funds will be available on Monday, no disruption to you. If you have more than that, I think they originally said 40 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar, and the rest will be determined by uh, the, the bankruptcy, you know, liquidation option. Then by Sunday, they said, oh, by the way, we have another bank, um, and, um, which was Signature Bank, uh, and, um, oh yeah, by the way, um, every large deposit is also going to be covered. But they didn't say we're changing the rule. They just said, well, because, uh, uh something, something hand wavy, hand wavy, systemically important, which nobody's concept of systemically important included Silicon Valley Bank before that <laughs> moment. And so now that's, that, that has to leave you wondering what, what I call the imponderables. If, if your cash is in a bank um, and that bank fails, will they or will they not make you all? Especially if you have a larger deposit. Um, and so I think everybody has to be looking at that and saying, well, if I own gold, it's not subject to these risks. Right, gold is the one financial asset that's not subject to a counterparty. There's no one else in the universe that you depend on to make good on it for your gold to still exist tomorrow morning, whereas your bank deposit doesn't exist if the bank doesn't exist. Right. And that's uh you know, that's the elephant in the room. That's why the price of gold is as robust as it is, despite lack of money printing, QE, you you know, inflation, right? So CPI is a bit down today. Um you know, all the, all the conventional drivers that everybody thinks drives the price of gold, clearly not in the driver's seat, you know, right now. Well, we talked about a lot of domestic issues, pu pushing gold higher, or at least keeping at the current level. Let, let, let's zoom out. There's so much going on. I've, it's like lately I've had a hard time just focusing on the U.S. personally, and uh, or actually focusing on everything else that goes around as well, because it's just too much almost. Um, you say the banking crisis is one of the drivers. If you, if you were to zoom out, what, what else is affecting the gold price in your opinion? I mean, you know, the same thing was true worldwide. I think there's a tendency, and, and, and you make a very good point, we should not be overly obsessed with problems in the U.S. The problems are everywhere. Uh, it's just that the U.S., and ironically, um, there's more and better data available um, and, you know, more intrepid journalists that are, you know, drilling down and, and finding all the stuff. And there's just more data theories and more other things. Um, but you have real banking problems, uh, you know, occurring elsewhere, obviously right before Silicon Valley Bank was Credit Suisse, um, you know, got seized and uh, handed over to UBS. Um, there are clearly problems in Deutsche Bank, um, clearly problems in uh, the Chinese banking system. And then a story happened very quiet at least, and well, yeah, as I was saying, the mainstream, I think the story was very quiet. And in the, uh, the corner of, of what would be called FinTwit, you know, the, the uh, financial folks on Twitter that talk about gold and de-dollarization all the time, uh, pretty quiet about Argentina a couple of weeks ago, basically running out of dollars. Now, what does that mean? So all these peripheral currencies attempt to maintain their value by having dollar backing and the theory is that if you have X amount of dollars relative to this, then then you're safe. But um, the way it actually works is when people are dumping your currency, you have to buy your currency back, which is a shrinking of the 
of the currency, shrinking of, of credit in that economy, plus all kinds of gyrations, as you can imagine. And you have to sell dollars to buy your currency. Well, what happens when you run out? And um, one side would say, well, that's de-dollarization, right? Now the Argentinian Central Bank has reached nirvana where they're de-dollarized, no more dollars. And therefore, that the, you know, the Argentinian peso should decouple from the dollar and rise, 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 because that's no longer anchored by this boat anchor that we call the dollar. Another theory says, well, when you run out of dollars, um, you, you know, then you run out of juice. It's like you've squeezed all the juice out <laughs> of the currency. You've wrung it dry. And of course, Argentina has been proving this about every eight years, uh, going back to, I think, the time of Perón, uh, a long, long, long time as, you know, they have these little bouts of hyperinflation, you know, lop three, four, five zeros off the currency. Um, all the domestic savers get screwed. Um, I have some uh, family in Argentina and I know how, how it works there. Basically, nobody trusts the banking system there. Yeah. And that's been true for many decades. And so anybody with any real degree of wealth has it in US dollars or Swiss francs in, uh, even in New York or in Zurich. Uh, and so, you know, they, they get the people with these devaluations and whatever. So, um, but there's a real dollar crisis out there that is a dollar shortage. But the rest of the world desperately craves dollars. That's why uh, the, the dollar was bid up so high relative to all the rest of the currencies. Now in this, you know, I, if, you, if you look at this as kind of a fight with a series of rounds, you know, dollar was, was going up against all the other currencies. Um, you know, the, the Fed was, was saying we're going to keep tightening. And then you have things start to break with the uh, banking system. And then the Fed is, I think, take a thing with the quantitative tightening with one hand, but give a thing with the other to your various, they don't call it repo, but term bank lending facility, if you what they call it, and, and various other mechanisms to try to put liquidity back in the market, which allows risk assets to find a bid, including all the other currencies. Um, but that crisis is still, is still brewing out there. You use a lot of big words. De De-dollarization is a big one, I think, that uh, that's spanning across media and like all channels right now, because even mainstream media started picking it up because apparently it was a popular topic to talk about. But before we you talk de-dollarization, I, I just wanted to throw in a tidbit of information. Bolivia only six weeks ago said, hey, we're going to start buying gold. And then uh, two weeks ago, they said, well, we're going to start selling gold because we don't have any U.S. dollars. Okay, <laughs> and, that's, and that's the central banks, and I thought that was hilarious because they were going to buy from the local artisanals, and then just to create and bring in U.S. dollars. A bit of the the flip side of the whole story, like how do you generate U.S. dollar reserves? Well, you have to sell gold, right? Like how how does that fit in into overall market scheme? I know it's bol only Bolivia, but uh, that's the flip side of the theory, isn't it? Well, it was also um, which is the African country in the, the currency is the SEDI, C-I-D-I. I think it's Ghana. Ghana, Ghana was selling gold um, as well, I think. They, they forced their local miners, which also include in the case of Ghana, I don't know about Bolivia, major, you know, uh, multinational mining companies, they forced <laughs> them to sell a certain percentage of the gold to the government and, and get paid in local currency. Um, and then, you know, the, the gold community tries to always tries to shoehorn this into a, there's a new gold standard coming <laughs> and I'm not going to lead the way and you're like, come on, please. And, um, you know, what is that? So now they have some gold, which they're buying at a discount. So basically it's a, it's a looting scheme. They're looting the miners, forcing them to get paid in this inferior currency, which the miners didn't want and, and don't need. And in fact, have to dump that currency probably back to the same central bank. Now the way these countries work is there's the two, there's two prices. Actually, in Argentina, I've been told there's like seven different prices for the currency, but there's the official one. And if you're if you're like a multinational mining company, you know you're dumping SETI for for dollars at whatever the official exchange rate is, and of course the market rate is many multiples of that. So they 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 screw these companies by taking their gold and and giving them this worthless script, and then they screw them again by not even allowing them to realize the the proper value of the script for, for the dollars. Um, and so then they get, they get some dollars that way and they get some gold that way and they can dump the gold to get dollars. They're all desperate for dollars. That's the thing that is, it's, I, I love the word, word, word reverse. You know, people think, well, gold is sound and the dollar is it, which is true. And therefore gold's going to go up and the dollar's going to go down, which is there are times when that's occurring, 
And there are times when it isn't, and it's because the whole system is perverse top to bottom. And part of the perversity is everybody desperately needs dollars. And you see it in, in Bolivia. Uh, no, and th that hasn't changed, right? And especially South America, very US dollar dependent. But there's, I have a chart here that shows the foreign exchange reserves by currency. And to back in 1998, before the uh, introduction of the euro, uh, the US dollar or the foreign exchange reserves in US dollar were over 70%, roughly 71, 72%. We're down now, like what I hear, like between 60, 55 and 60%, right? The euro is another 20%. You have the Japanese yen, the British pound, but uh, they were both below, like, or right around 5%. Um, the rise of the Chinese one is a, is, a, is a big discussion. And uh, depending on who you talk to, it's either a hot topic or it's like, eh, like, they'll need some time, right? Because um, my point is the de-dollarization is starting to accelerate. What, what's your opinion on that and how does gold sort of factor into this? Well, a couple of things. The first thing I would say is that if the dollar is replaced by dollar derivative as a particular central bank's reserve, so let's say you don't use the dollar anymore, and now you have the euro as your as, as part of your backing. But the euro is, according to that number, 60% backed by dollars. Shit. And 60% backed by other things, probably including pounds and Swiss francs and who knows else. And those things are 60% backed Shit. by dollars. You see the actual backing, right? You need some sort of limit, L'Hopital's rule or something like that to figure out what the actual backing is, hell of a lot higher than 60%. And you can swap one script for another. They're all dollar derivatives. None of them can displace or replace the U.S. dollar. Uh, and now that brings us to the yuan, um, which is a relatively small currency, certainly in terms of forex trading volumes. Um, China has capital controls, and I, I don't know how most people who think that the yuan is going to replace the dollar think of capital controls. But the reality on the ground is that everybody in China has any degree of wealth is trying to evade the capital control, dump the yuan and get dollars. Now, China is a very authoritarian, I'll just restrict one comment to that sort of country. When you break the law, especially that sort of law, you're risking your life. Like they could disappear you in the middle of the night, take you to some secret police dungeon and torture you. Like it's not, it's really not um, uh, good for your health and not to mention career prospects. The fact that people are, are, are risking this to dump their yuan and get dollars tells you a lot. And if they were to freely float that currency, which would be a prerequisite to any kind of use in international uh, you know, trade, um, the first wave would be everybody in China who was desperate to sell their yuan and get dollars would now be free to do so. We'd have to find what level the Chinese currency would be trading at. And I think it would be a, a fraction. I think it would go down you know, massively, crash, and find a new level. That would be the first step. Okay. Then the second step is transparency. The way it works in China is the, the central planner tells each region what their GDP number is going to be. And then each region tells the cities in that region what's going to be. And then everything is goal seeking from there. It, you, you, you know, as, as dishonest and as, as crazy as the US system has become, you know, other systems like China are, you know, much less transparent, much less honest and much crazier and you know in so many ways um so i i i it, it, i don't think any irredeemable paper currency even if they weren't dollar derivatives could displace and replace the u.s dollar they don't have the liquidity they don't have the transparency the trust people talk about the BRICS: brazil russia india china who do you want to be a creditor to you know, is that is that is that Lula in Brazil? Is that uh, Modi in India? Is that Putin in Russia? Is that Xi in China? Who do you want to be a lender to? And that's what it is to own the currency, and um, the dollar cemented in, and and can't really be displaced by any of that. And the one thing that can is the yellow metal or the four letter word, uh, <laughs> which is its name, and and nobody wants that. So <laughs> that's the state of the world today in 2023. And, and I say that some, somewhat tongue in cheek, obviously some of us do want that, but the path of how you get from here to there isn't just, well, um, you know, the dollar is unstable and it sucks, which is true. Therefore, uh, you know, I, I love the, uh, South park, uh, gnome underpants business model. Um, if anybody's not familiar with that, you can 
find the video clip of that and there's a Wikipedia page on it. Basically, step one, steal all the underwear. Step two, question mark. Step three, profits. You know, <laughs> step one, the dollar sucks. Step two, question mark. Step three, XYZ is going to replace it. And it's that, it's that question mark step that um, needs a hell of a lot more thought. Now, my company has a particular idea on that. You have to get gold back into use as finance. You have to get um, productive companies that are borrowing, releasing gold to do productive things and uh, therefore pay interest on it. And it's interest that will draw the gold in the market. Um, but whether or not, whether our answer is right or not, um, people need to be thinking about that step too. How do you get there from here? And it's not a matter if the price goes up, right? If, if you'd had this conversation 20 odd years ago, you know, the price was 200 and something. Now we're at 2000 and something, we're at 10 X. We're no closer to gold circulating than we were, you know, 10 years ago. And it could be 20,000 and it wouldn't circulate. Um, so anyway, it's just a few, I don't know if I answered your question or just went off on a rant. But. <laughs> no, no, it was great. It was great. I just have a couple of follow-ups because again, it's like, I keep going with the de-dollarization debate and it seems to be gaining momentum. And personally, like I have a hard time seeing it as well. Hey, there's an ego involved in the U S being is like, Hey, we're the world reserve currency. We're not going to give that up so easily. And at B is the, also the other side of the coin is like, we, we hear a lot of stories about the East or anything actually East of Germany buying gold to the central banks. I mean. So there is suspicions that they're, they're working on something in the background, but nobody knows what, how much gold China owns, for example, adding fuel to the, like, let's call it for the conspiracy theory of a new gold backed currency. Do you, do you see that being a likely scenario well, at all? The gold currency, if you look at it historically, is when there's enough trust in the system, which means it will apply, which kind of precludes China, but leaving that aside, um, where people are. You know, currency units are created one deposit of gold at a time that people are voluntarily bringing their gold in handing it to the bank and getting a piece of paper in return because the trust exists without question and the piece of paper is slightly more convenient than the gold um that is not the the situation that we're in today with china as i said the people that are adjusted paper currency let alone a gold promise uh let alone any other you know russia bolivia you, none of these are, are, are countries you would be a lender to, let alone give them your gold and say, I, I trust, I'll, I'll get it back what I want. Um, so that so that's how a gold currency begins, and that's how every unit of that gold currency comes into existence as you know, a deposit of gold coin. Um, people want to bypass that. That's a slow, arduous process. It's daunting. So people want to say, okay, well, what if you just reverse the you know, cause and effect, put the, put the card before the horse, and say, okay, you have this many units of a currency, you have this much gold allegedly sitting in vault. Um, I say allegedly because I don't think anybody trusts the U.S. saying it is 8,000 tons. And I would sooner trust the U.S. than China for, for a statistic like that. But the U.S. has not audited that gold since Eisenhower, since before, you, you know, you and I were born. Um, and um, so we, we allegedly have this amount of gold in the vault over here. I would promise not to print more currency units than 10 to one or 100 to one or 2001 or whatever against this gold center over there. And it's number one, it's starting off life as a toothless promise. That's nothing more than a political slogan. We promise to have no more than this of any currency units relative to the gold and the current crop of politicians seem really earnest in saying that, uh, when they stand in front of the cameras and the microphones. Does anybody believe that? I mean, there's no way, right? You wouldn't give them your gold under those circumstances. As obvious that what's going to happen, like was a debt ceiling in the U.S. Okay, you know, let us raise the debt ceiling. We promise we're going to get a handle on this thing. How many times has there been a debt ceiling debate in the last 20 years? I've lost count, dozens of times this has happened. And every time there's always, well, just one more and just one more. There's no credibility to any of that. But the bigger issue is that the... There's no teeth to the promise. And in an honest monetary system where there's the rule of law and you've deposited your gold coin in the bank, there's there's teeth, which is you have the right to redeem that currency for that gold coin. And if the bank should fail to honor that, it's a, it's a contractual obligation. If the bank fails to honor that, then there's a legal process for corporations that can't honor or won't honor their 
obligations, and that's receivership and bankruptcy. And the court appointed receiver liquidated everything for the benefit of depositors, and the equity holders get nothing, or they get you know whatever's left over at the end. Since they're the ones that are in control, of course, they're going to run it in a sound way because they don't want to lose everything. <laughs> and so none of those uh, prerequisites exist in, oh, China is going to declare a gold standard. Um, it's just total reversing cause and effect. The one other thing I'll say is the gold standard is the monetary system of a free market. So for all the countries that are, you know, declaring their principle, the free market principles and moving towards the free market, the gold standard would be a great monetary system. For all those authoritarian governments that like to disappear dissidents and, and squeeze them until they break, as China did with any number of dissidents, including apparently Jack Ma, um, you know, disappeared from the public, he's critical, disappeared from the public spotlight for what a year, comes back and is suddenly very quiet and supportive of the regime now. You know, why would you want gold? I mean, you're moving in the opposite direction, away from paper script into, uh, you know, social credit. And, um, you know, if we like you, you get to, uh, you, you know, have some meat in your rations. And if we don't like you, you know, you can starve. That's that's the direction that authoritarian re regimes want to go anyway. Okay. So you, you brought up the debt ceiling, which is an interesting discussion. I'm going to like form, form a question around it because I've, I've read a paper you know, just this afternoon here as well, where the only change of status quo, meaning getting rid of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency, would be a default by the U.S. Okay. And so the, the question is two pronged now. And that, I'm assuming I know part one of your of the answers. Okay, it's not going to happen in June, right? But the, the other question is, will it happen thereafter? There are so many factors because so many empires just drowned in their debt. You know, at the height of uh, every empire, there was always too much debt. Roman empires, all the other ones, even the British Empire, they all collapsed because they had too much debt. Are, we, are you expecting it to collapse at some point? Are we going to go Chinese, or sorry, that Japanese levels of uh, debt to GDP ratios of 250%? Well, I, I think the answer is, probably, is both. Um, <laughs> you know, what Japan proved is that there's no one magic number of, of a ratio of debt to GDP. And then when you touch and go beyond that number, then you know, ruin is, is imminent. Um, and, you know, the U.S. is quite different from Japan in a number of regards, again, being the world's reserve currency, which means they'll have greater capacity. Whatever the limit is for Japan, which they haven't hit yet, their currency has not collapsed either, um, although it's down quite a lot over the last, what, 18 months or so. Um, and, and the U.S. dollar will be even more robust than that. In the end, of course, it will collapse. But now, just getting back to the 60% number, Suppose the um, European Central Bank and you know the individual central banks of the European countries have an average of sixty percent dollar backing to their you know which which means sixty percent of the asset side of the balance sheet is dollars. Suppose the dollar were to go to zero, so the asset side loses sixty percent overnight, and the liability side, of course, is denominated in euros, so it's firm. What would happen to the European Central Bank and its credit quality? It would be destroyed. That would be if everyone needs to bomb taken to the balance sheet of the European Central Bank, uh, the Bundesbank, uh, the Banque de France, et cetera, et cetera, would, would all be just annihilated. The derivatives could never survive the collapse of the underlying. It would be like saying, what happens to Apple call options if Apple goes to zero? I mean, the thought that there could be such a thing as an Apple call option is, is preposterous, you know, in that, in that scenario. So, um, that's not a scenario that's good for other currencies. That's just simply, you know, a great ruin. Now, there's no economic reason why they have to default in nominal terms because they control, and I hate the term printing press, but oversimplify it. They control the printing press of their own currency. Uh, this is entirely a political grandstanding exercise. <laughs> um, and there's no mechanical or, or monetary reason why they can't count the dollars to, um, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a political line in the sand. It's Bucks Bunny drawing that line and tearing the monster across the line, and he keeps doing it until he gets the monster to fall off the edge of the cliff. Um, you know, so, so in that sense, it's a big nothing burger, but nobody can really predict what people are going to do, right? If you want to predict how the monetary system is going to behave, 
Well, there's a science to that. It does what it does because it, it, it works in the way that it works. But now if you want to say, this is what a person is going to do, well, that's much harder because people have this pesky thing called free will and emotions and all kinds of other stuff going on. And politics makes very strange bad follow-ups. Um, you know, you look at, uh, at the, the last 10 years, how many times did one party suddenly adopt what you would have thought was the other party's line and vice versa. And, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example of, uh, um, you know, the Republicans were, were for a hard lockdown at the beginning of COVID, and then they turned against it. And, you know, all these sort of weird things happen. Um, doctors who know better were suddenly, uh, you know, lining up behind the idea of mask mandates. Um, you know, could, could there be a default because of politics? Yeah, maybe there could. <laughs> maybe a really good example would be Silicon Valley Bank. Who was opposed to the bailout? Well, it was the hard right in alliance with the hard left. Both hated the idea of the bailout of Silicon Valley Bank, and for different, for opposite reasons. The hard right hated it because they perceived Silicon Valley Bank as being a woke liberal institution. The hard left hated it because they perceived it as a bailout for rich white people. <laughs> and so you, you got very strange bad follows. Could there be a default? Who the heck knows? That's, that. that's beyond my swim lane. But there's no mechanical reason for it. There's no monetary reason for it. And my guess would be that um, everybody's got a grandstand, score the political points they want to score, position themselves for the election. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, and, and of course the treasury has a million tricks up their sleeve for how they can continue, you know, for things to go for quite a while, technically not having any increase in debt, borrow from the social security, this, that, the other thing, whatever. Um, and my guess would be that it's going to be a nothing burger in the end, like the previous 50 of them have been. Yeah. Interesting. Keith, based on what you're saying, your question popped into my head, and it's pretty much the opposite of what we always talk with our guests is based on all the, all the things you've just said, do you see actually the gold price going down the next few months then? So if the crisis is averted, everything's fine. Let's say June 2nd, everybody comes back to the office. It's like, all right, I'm dumping my gold crisis averted. We're done with this. I, I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, to, to use the term bull market and gold, as, as we just said a moment ago, it's really bear market and dollar, right? You just have to look at things the other way, right? Gold, gold approximately, you know, between 15 to 16 milligrams. I'm sorry, the dollar being 15 to 16 milligrams of gold right now, the dollar continuing to fall, um, is, is what I'd expect. So we have a, a model that we, that we use to calculate what we call the fundamental price of gold. And this is for free on monetary metalscom on our website, um, which attempts to calculate what would the gold price, what, what would gold be clearing at if there was no leverage, you know, the speculators weren't using leverage to uh, back out their effect on the price. Sometimes the speculators are very bullish. They can pull the price up. I have gotten real hate mail. There was a time when the silver price was $22. I said, I think the fundamentals will put it at 15 or so. And, um, but it, w when that move finally happens, you know, picture a rubber band stretched between two pins and you pulled it and stretched it really far. When you finally, it lets go, it's not going to just stop even. It's going to overshoot you in the cold, opposite direction. You could see a 13 handle or 12 handle on silver. And I got hate mail. And I think there was a 10 handle at the end of the day on that one. <laughs> um, there's other times when the speculators are pessimistic, which is the case right now. So we calculate a fundamental price of well over 200 bucks, or excuse me, 2,200 bucks in gold, uh, and about $28 in silver. So, um, right now the speculators are pessimistic. They're pulling it down a little bit. Okay. Suppose the crisis is resolved. You know, the thing with these things is, and, and people weren't stupid in 2008 either. There's resolution in the sense of the immediate acute phase is gone. And then there's, okay, but is the patient really getting any better or do we just give him an infusion and four units of blood? Like, okay, that patches up like immediate. He's no. not bleeding out anymore. He'll get oxygen into his brain, but he's still really, really, you know, unhealthy. Whatever that was that caused that in the first place is still there. And I think that, um, you know, there's a very interesting dynamic when it comes to gold, I guess, and that is, and I myself came through it after 2008. 
when people come to gold, it, you know, there's kind of an awakening process. And I hate that analogy, but I'll, I'll run with it. Like, you know, they're going about doing their thing. In my case, it was nose with the grindstone building a software company. I just, you know, aside from didn't have a huge amount of money to be betting on anything, my nose was with the grindstone just doing what I was doing, just not focused on this stuff. I happened to sell my company right before the crisis, so August of 2008. Um, so I had a lot of attention and suddenly a lot of money to try to protect. But whatever, whatever it is, when, when one of these things happens, a lot of people kind of wake up, realize there's a problem, and then they see the craziness of what the government is doing. And even when the acute phase of the crisis passes, it's not like I ever said after 2008, well, I said I'm going to sell on my gold and I'm going to go all in on stonks, which term didn't exist in 2009. But um, I think a lot of people who come to gold stay because they realize it's not about betting on price. You know, if you're looking for an asset that is going to skyrocket in dollar terms, it really make you big capital gains. Bitcoin is the obvious superior, it's superior at skyrocketing, and also crashing. Uh, but, you know, gold is terrible because it's too damn stable. The point of gold isn't that it's going to go up. The point of gold is that it isn't going to default, which is an entire you know, return of capital, not return on capital. <laughs> and uh, I think people come to gold and stay with it. And so, yeah, I think the dollar is continuing its decline in in uh, economic value, which is measured in gold, and no, I don't. I don't think that. I think that. I don't think that goes away. And I think we're back in a secular, slow, perhaps early stages, kind of secular bull market in gold, Except. where you know, the, in a bull market, you're supposed to buy the dips, maybe optionally sell the blips, but buy the dips. Whereas in a bear market, you're supposed to sell the blips. I think we've now flipped. I think um, I, I, one of my guests recently said that on the program as well. It's now time to buy the dips in gold and silver. That uh, that that script has flipped, as you said. So it's interesting, interesting times. And uh, Keith, Keith, just sort of put a bow around our conversation because it's all themed a little bit like how not to think about gold because that's a field guide you put out. Are we actually, based on the discussion we just had for the last 30 minutes, are we thinking about gold the right way here? Well, if, if we're thinking, okay, gold's going to go up, I, I don't. I definitely don't think that's the right way. And as we said, it's the dollar going down. So if you own gold, you're avoiding the losses. Yeah. You know, there's an elevator going down into the basement and beyond, and you simply get off the elevator. Okay, I'll just stay here. Um, it doesn't mean you're going anywhere up, but at least you're not going down. Um, you, you know, and then in, in the field guide, we talk about all sorts of other things. Um, my favorite of which is what I call the famous buyer fallacy. Hey, look, the Central Bank of Ireland just it's, announced they bought seven tons of gold. Gold's going to go up. And, you know, people love to focus on it because the Central Bank of Ireland is a big and famous thing. They buy, like, they buy gold by the ton, obviously. Um, but, you know, if you look at it, if they, if they bought seven tons, then that means, what, 70,000 people or 700,000 people sold that gold to them. Are those 700,000 people wrong and they're right? Is it vice versa? And I, I think there's no predictive information value in, in those sorts of things. Um, virtually all the gold ever mined in 5,000 years of human history, so far as we know, is still in human hands. It's unlike any, any other commodity in that respect. And when gold sloshes around, some of that gold sloshes around from one corner of the market to the other, into an ETF, out of an ETF, into a central bank, out of a central bank, um, and into other whatever vehicles or mechanisms, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really mean anything. Something else is selling no. the value of gold, and and not those little uh, sloshes and eddies <laughs> and waves, you know, within this ocean of, of gold liquidity. Interesting, yeah, interesting points. Interesting points. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was like we we touched on a lot. That's why it ran a little longer. Than I had originally scheduled, but uh, I couldn't stop myself from asking the question. So, no uh, and uh, of course, we'll link to the field guide down below here in the comments and in the description of the video as well. And uh, Keith, any any last closing remarks? How, how bullish are you on a scale of one to ten for gold and silver right now? Well, actually, let's split them up uh, for gold and silver because based on your targets that you mentioned, silver is trailing gold. Yeah, I mean, you know, gold if if it gets to twenty two fifty. Um, that's a new all-time high in dollars, isn't it? I don't think it hit quite that high in the last little blip. 
Uh, and so over $28 is nowhere near, uh, uh, you know, it's all time high, which is it's touched. It's about $50 twice. Um, I think the two, uh, they're both monetary metals. And I think there's a difference between the two. And that is gold is the, 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 the province of the capital owning class. Um, and it trades against other capital assets and silver. Yes. Obviously the capital owning class can own it. It has an industrial component and to give into a crappier economy that, you know, demand can weaken, but even the monetary reservation demand for silver tends to be more of a wage earner who's setting aside. Think about it, if you're, if you're working for wages and you're setting aside 10% of your weekly paycheck to put into precious metals, and that's $50 or something like that, $50 worth of gold is what? Can yeah. everybody see that? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just satisfying to hold. If you put it in your pocket, you lose it in the lint. Um, you know, you have to get a little sturdy card with a little <laughs> fraction of a gram kind of little wafer floating in it. Um, and fifty dollars worth of silver is a couple of ounces. So, um, you know, which which has some real heft to it. So, um, in terms of owning the physical, if you're a wage earner, silver is really the only game in town, and that's always been the case for thousands of years. That's why silver is the junior monetary metal, and that's well, that's why two monetary metals both survived is they had different applications in slightly different markets. Um, and so if the wage earner is under increasing stress and pressure, and right now we're seeing, you know, layoffs are just getting going in the economy. Um, the, the wage earner unfortunately is going to take a beating in this. Um, and if that's the case, then silver will be under more, uh, you know, downward pressure than, than gold. Um, so I'd say, you know, moderately bullish, I mean, intermediate, uh, price target of 2200 ish now, just like us with, with the negative and silver back in, in 2013 and 2014, you know, when, when, and if gold gets to 2250, likely it continues going. So I could easily see a 23, a 2400, you know, not crazy no. bullish. I'm not going to sit here and say $5,000 by next week. Um, I think there's more mayhem that our monetary masters have to commit before that happens. And, and ultimately, if I want to leave people with a thought, it's like, be careful what you wish for gold at $5,000, let alone $50,000. Yeah. You get a lot more yeah. dollars, but it could be a really unpleasant world. Um, there's a really happy place. There's a rat tail associated with that. A very long and nasty one, I think. So good, yeah. good, good point. And on that bombshell, Keith, we're good. We're going to end that conversation. Keith, All right. thank you so much for joining us. As always, it was a pleasure speaking with you and uh, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Keith. Good conversation. Thanks. Fantastic. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. SF Live Sort Financially here. And uh, we're back from our hiatus. What, what do you think is going to happen here? Is the de-dollarization de story just a hoax? What do, you, what do you think? Like, is the US dollar strong enough to survive the current turmoil? Put it in the comments. I'm curious to hear what you're thinking because we'll be answering. If you have any other questions, of course, we'll, have, we'll be asking them in the next few interviews here, either with Keith or other guests as well. Have I mentioned? Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Thank you so much. We'll be back with lots more.